Positivism and Behaviorism by Ludwig von Mises This article is excerpted from Theory and History and narrated by John Pruden. What differentiates the realm of the natural sciences from that of the sciences of human action is the categorical system resorted to in each in interpreting phenomena and constructing theories. The natural sciences do not know anything about final causes. Inquiry and theorizing are entirely guided by the category of causality. The field of the sciences of human action is the orbit of purpose and of conscious aiming at ends. It is teleological. Both categories were resorted to by primitive man and are resorted to today by everybody in daily thinking and acting. The most simple skills and techniques imply knowledge gathered by rudimentary research into causality. Where people did not know how to seek the relation of cause and effect, they looked for a teleological interpretation. They invented deities and devils to whose purposeful action certain phenomena were ascribed. A god emitted lightning and thunder. Another god, angry about some acts of men, killed the offenders by shooting arrows. A witch's evil eye made women barren and cows dry. Such beliefs generated definite methods of action. Conduct pleasing to the deity, offering of sacrifices and prayer, were considered suitable means to appease the deity's anger and to avert its revenge. Magic rites were employed to neutralize witchcraft. Slowly, people came to learn that meteorological events, disease, and the spread of plagues are natural phenomena and that lightning rods and antiseptic agents provide effective protection while magic rites are useless. It was only in the modern era that the natural sciences in all their fields substituted causal research for finalism. The marvelous achievements of the experimental natural sciences prompted the emergence of a materialistic metaphysical doctrine, positivism. Positivism flatly denies that any field of inquiry is open for teleological research. The experimental methods of the natural sciences are the only appropriate methods for any kind of investigation. They alone are scientific, while the traditional methods of the sciences of human action are metaphysical. That is, in the terminology of positivism, superstitious and spurious. Positivism teaches that the task of science is exclusively the description and the interpretation of sensory experience. It rejects the introspection of psychology, as well as all historical disciplines. It is especially fanatical in its condemnation of economics. Auguste Comte, by no means the founder of positivism, but merely the inventor of its name, suggested as a substitute for the traditional methods of dealing with human action a new branch of science, sociology. Sociology should be social physics, shaped according to the epistemological pattern of Newtonian mechanics. The plan was so shallow and impractical that no serious attempt was ever made to realize it. The first generation of Kant's followers turned instead toward what they believed to be biological and organic interpretation of social phenomena. They indulged freely in metaphorical language and quite seriously discussed such problems as what in the social body should be classed as intracellular substance. When the absurdity of this biologism or organicism became obvious, the sociologists completely abandoned the ambitious pretensions of Kant. There was no longer any question of discovering a posteriori laws of social change. Various historical, ethnographical, and psychological studies were put out under the label sociology. Many of these publications were dilettantish and confused. Some are acceptable contributions to various fields of historical research. Without any value, on the other hand, were the writings of those who termed sociology their arbitrary metaphysical effusions about the recondite meaning and end of the historical process, which had been previously styled philosophy of history. Thus, Emil Durkheim and his school revived under the appellation Group Mind the old specter of Romanticism and the German school of historical jurisprudence, the Volksgeist. In spite of this manifest failure of the positivist program, a neo-positivist movement has arisen. It stubbornly repeats all the fallacies of Kant. 
The same motive inspires these writers that inspired Kant. They are driven by an idiosyncratic abhorrence to the market economy and its political corollary, representative government, freedom of thought, speech, and the press. They long for totalitarianism, dictatorship, and the ruthless oppression of all dissenters, taking, of course, for granted that they themselves or their intimate friends will be vested with the supreme office and the power to silence all opponents. Kant, without shame, advocated suppression of all doctrines he disliked. The most obtrusive champion of the neo-positivist program concerning the sciences of human action was Otto Neurath, who, in 1919, was one of the outstanding leaders of the short-lived Soviet regime of Munich and later cooperated briefly in Moscow with the bureaucracy of the Bolsheviks. Knowing they cannot advance any tenable argument against the economists' critique of their plans, these passionate communists tried to discredit economics wholesale on epistemological grounds. The two main varieties of the neo-positivistic assault on economics are panphysicalism and behaviorism. Both claim to substitute a purely causal treatment of human action for the, as they declare unscientific, teleological treatment. Panphysicalism teaches that the procedures of physics are the only scientific method of all branches of science. It denies that any essential differences exist between the natural sciences and the sciences of human action. This denial lies behind the panphysicalists' slogan, Unified Science. Sense experience, which conveys to man his information about physical events, provides him also with all information about the behavior of his fellow men. Study of the way his fellows react to various stimuli does not differ essentially from the study of the way other objects react. The language of physics is the universal language of all branches of knowledge, without exception. What cannot be rendered in the language of physics is metaphysical nonsense. It is arrogant pretension in man to believe that his role in the universe is different from that of other objects. In the eyes of the scientist, all things are equal. All talk about consciousness, volition, and aiming at ends is empty. Man is just one of the elements in the universe. The applied science of social physics, social engineering, can deal with man in the same way technology deals with copper and hydrogen. The pan-physicalist might admit at least one essential difference between man and the objects of physics— the stones and the atoms reflect neither upon their own nature, properties, and behavior, nor upon those of man. They do not engineer either themselves or man. Man is at least different from them insofar as he is a physicist and an engineer. It is difficult to conceive how one could deal with the activities of an engineer without realizing that he chooses between various possible lines of conduct and is intent upon attaining definite ends. Why does he build a bridge rather than a ferry? Why does he build one bridge with a capacity of 10 tons and another with a capacity of 20 tons? Why is he intent upon constructing bridges that do not collapse? Or is it only an accident that most bridges do not collapse? If one eliminates from the treatment of human action the notion of conscious aiming at definite ends, one must replace it by the really metaphysical, idea that some superhuman agency leads men, independently of their will, toward a predestined goal, that what put the bridge builder into motion was the preordained plan of geists, or the material productive forces which mortal men are forced to execute. To say that man reacts to stimuli and adjusts himself to the conditions of his environment does not provide a satisfactory answer. To the stimulus offered by the English Channel, some people have reacted by staying at home. Others have crossed it in rowboats, sailing ships, steamers, or, in modern times, simply by swimming. Some fly over it in planes. Others design schemes for tunneling under it. It is vain to ascribe the differences in reaction to differences in attendant circumstances, such as the state of technological knowledge and the supply of labor and capital goods. These other conditions, too, are of human origin and can only be explained by resorting to teleological methods. The approach of behaviorism is in some respects different from that of panphysicalism, 
but it resembles the latter in its hopeless attempt to deal with human action without reference to consciousness and aiming at ends. It bases its reasoning on the slogan, Adjustment. Like any other being, man adjusts himself to the conditions of his environment. But behavioralism fails to explain why different people adjust themselves to the same conditions in different ways. Why do some people flee violent aggression while others resist it? Why did the peoples of Western Europe adjust themselves to the scarcity of all things on which human well-being depends in a way entirely different from that of the Orientals? Behaviorism proposes to study human behavior according to the methods developed by animal and infant psychology. It seeks to investigate reflexes and instincts, automatisms and unconscious reactions. But it has told us nothing about the reflexes that have built cathedrals, railroads, and fortresses, the instincts that have produced philosophies, poems, and legal systems, the automatisms that have resulted in the growth and decline of empires, the unconscious reactions that are splitting atoms. Behaviorism wants to observe human behavior from without and to deal with it merely as reaction to a definite situation. It punctiliously avoids any reference to meaning and purpose. However, a situation cannot be described without analyzing the meaning which the man concerned finds in it. If one avoids dealing with this meaning, one neglects the essential factor that decisively determines the mode of reaction. This reaction is not automatic, but depends entirely upon the interpretation and value judgments of the individual, who aims to bring about, if feasible, a situation which he prefers to the state of affairs that would prevail if he were not to interfere. Consider a behaviorist describing the situation which an offer to sell brings about without reference to the meaning each party attaches to it. In fact, behaviorism would outlaw the study of human action and substitute physiology for it. The behaviorists never succeeded in making clear the difference between physiology and behaviorism. Watson declared that physiology is particularly interested in the functioning of parts of the animal. Behaviorism, on the other hand, while it is intensely interested in all of the functioning of these parts, is intrinsically interested in what the whole animal will do. However, such physiological phenomena as the resistance of the body to infection or the growth and aging of an individual can certainly not be called behavior of parts. On the other hand, if one wants to call such a gesture as the movement of an arm, either to strike or to caress, behavior of the whole human animal, the idea can only be that such a gesture cannot be imputed to any separate part of the being. But what else can this something to which it must be imputed be, if not the meaning and the intention of the actor, or that unnamed thing from which meaning and intention originate? Behaviorism asserts that it wants to predict human behavior. But it is impossible to predict the reaction of a man accosted by another with the words, You rat! without referring to the meaning that the man spoken to attaches to the epithet. Both varieties of positivism decline to recognize the fact that men aim purposefully at definite ends. As they see it, all events must be interpreted by the relationship of stimulus and response, and there is no room left for a search for final causes. Against this rigid dogmatism, it is necessary to stress the point that the rejection of finalism in dealing with events outside the sphere of human action is enjoined upon science only by the insufficiency of human reason. The natural sciences must refrain from dealing with final causes because they are unable to discover any final causes, not because they can prove that no final causes are operative. The cognizance of the interconnectedness of all phenomena and of the regularity in their concatenation and sequence, and the fact that causality research works and has enlarged human knowledge, do not preemptorily preclude the assumption that final causes are operative in the universe. The reason for the natural sciences' neglect for final causes and their exclusive preoccupation with causality research is that this method works. The contrivances designed according to the scientific theories run the way the theories predicted 
and thus provide a pragmatic verification for their correctness. On the other hand, the magic devices did not come up to expectations and do not bear witness to the magic world view. It is obvious that it is also impossible to demonstrate satisfactorily by ratiocination that the alter ego is a being that aims purposefully at ends. But the same pragmatic proof that can be advanced in favor of the exclusive use of causal research in the field of nature can be advanced in favor of the exclusive use of teleological methods in the field of human action. It works, while the idea of dealing with men as if they were stones or mice does not work. It works not only in the search for knowledge and theories, but no less in daily practice. The positivist arrives at his point of view surreptitiously. He denies to his fellow men the faculty of choosing ends and the means to attain these ends. But at the same time, he claims for himself the ability to choose consciously between various methods of scientific procedure. He shifts his ground as soon as it comes to the problems of engineering, whether technological or social. He designs plans and policies which cannot be interpreted as merely being automatic reactions to stimuli. He wants to deprive all his fellows of the right to act in order to reserve this privilege for himself alone. He is a virtual dictator. As the behaviorist tells us, man can be thought of as an assembled organic machine ready to run. He disregards the fact that while machines run the way the engineer and the operator make them run, men run spontaneously here and there. At birth, human infants, regardless of their heredity, are as equal as Fords. Starting from this manifest falsehood, the behaviorist proposes to operate the human Ford the way the operator drives his car. He acts as if he owned humanity and were called upon to control and to shape it according to his own designs, for he himself is above the law, the God-sent ruler of mankind. Karl Mannheim developed a comprehensive plan to produce the best possible human types by deliberately reorganizing the various groups of social factors. We, that is, Karl Mannheim and his friends, will determine what the highest good of society and the peace of mind of the individual require. Then we will revamp mankind, for our vocation is the planned guidance of people's lives. The most remarkable thing about such ideas is that in the 30s and 40s they were styled democratic, liberal, and progressive. Josef Goebbels was more modest than Mannheim in that he wanted only to revamp the German people, and not the whole of mankind. But in his approach to the problem, he did not differ essentially from Mannheim. In a letter of April 12, 1933, to Wilhelm Fortwängler, he referred to the we to whom the responsible task has been entrusted to fashion out of the raw stuff of the masses the firm and well-shaped structure of the nation. Unfortunately, neither Mannheim nor Goebbels told us who had entrusted them with the task of reconstructing and recreating men. As long as positivism does not explain philosophies and theories and the plans and policies derived from them in terms of its stimulus response scheme, it defeats itself. The Ludwig von Mises Institute hopes you have enjoyed this audio, Mises Daily. For a world of free market literature, media, and discussion, visit Mises.org.